May we pray. Lord, open our hearts, our minds, with your very spirit. So as we think about these scriptures and pray over them and celebrate them and proclaim them, we may hear with joy what you have to say to us this very day. For we ask it in your Son's name. Amen. This is VBS week. You wouldn't know, would you? Um, come out. It's going to be, we're going to have fun. And if, if nothing else, come out and enjoy a, a great meal and have some fellowship with the volunteers at VBS. It's, I'm sure it's going, to be, it's going to be great. I told Mary this morning when she mentioned her, the, the, her Baptist roots that my mother was Southern Baptist and she used to call Methodist backslidden Baptist. But I really like what Norman McLean said in his book, A River Runs Through It, that uh, Methodists are Baptists who learned how to read. <laughs> so, uh, a young mother was walking with her daughter, and the child, as a child will do, saw something on the ground, and she picked it up, and she immediately went to her mouth. And the mother grabbed her hand and said, No! And it shocked the child. Why, Mommy? Because that's been on the ground. And it's going to have germs on it. And if you put that in your mouth, you're going to get those germs. And it can make you very sick. Oh. So she dropped whatever it was on the ground, and they continued to walk along. A few feet down, uh, the, the child says, Mommy, how did you get so smart? How do you know so much? Well, it's because I passed the test at mommy school. And the child said, oh, I think I understand. And they walked along a little further. And then the mother, the little child said, mommy, when a mommy doesn't pass the test, does that mean they have to be daddies? <laughs> now, what does that have to do with Father's Day? Absolutely nothing. Well, maybe it does. Because we dads, we dads, like to think that we can fix almost anything. And if we can't fix it, it simply means we don't have the right tool. And look out Lowe's. And if we can't fix it, it may also mean we don't have the right size hammer. Or we have not hit it in the right place. But today... The text, Father's Day, reminds us that there are some things that we dads just cannot fix. Again, uh, as I've said numerous times now, I saw something in this text I have never seen before. The traditional interpretation, and most of the times when I preached on this text, uh, I got caught up like everyone else in Jesus stilling the storm and, and, and extracting, extracting out of that that Jesus goes with us into the torment, torment and will calm the storms of life for us. Now, I'm not going to stand here this morning and tell you that interpretation is not true. I believe that it is true. But I also believe that there's a deeper meaning in this text than the one that, uh, that's so sentimental uh, to us and the one that we often hear about it. Uh, the way the writer tells the story takes us back to the very beginning of time when there was nothing and God created something out of nothing. Latin, it's ex nihilo. And, uh, you know... And, and God created the earth, and, and the earth was covered with water, and God's spirit just brooded over that water. And eventually, water was separated from land, and creatures were created, and then out of common clay, you know, red South Carolina clay, God scooped up and molded, molded a person person that resembled creatures of heaven. 
and then breathed into the nostrils of that lump of clay, and it became a living being. Ruach is the Spirit of God. Ruach is the wind of God that God put into that lump of clay. Now, we can see that wind, that Ruach, play out through the Old Testament with the nation Israel and uh, with the Hebrew people. And then it leaps over into the New Testament, and we see it again. Uh, it just has a different a word. It's pneuma now, but it's the same meaning. It's, it's the spirit or the breath, the wind of God. And it's that spirit and breath and wind we see breathed into the church breathed into the nostrils of the church at Pentecost, creating a living force here on earth, creating again the living Christ, the body of Christ in the world. This breath is not always comfortable Regardless of what the feel-good ministers on television and some mega church pastors uh, will tell you, it's not always comfortable. It's not always easy. Sometimes the breath of God brings discomfort. Sometimes it will bring chaos. Sometimes it will lead you straight into chaos. It will disturb you. So, if you want God to only bring you harmony and comfort and tranquility, run. Run. Run now. Don't let the doors close before you get to your car. Run. Because it's not going to happen. During the 60s, there was, there was a lot of chaos in the world wasn't there? Those of us who can remember it, those of us who were in it, we remember the chaos of the 60s, you know, civil rights, Vietnam War, politics. If we were under 25, we were suspicious of everybody 40 and above. We were suspicious of institutions, all politicians. Well, we still are. But it was a time it was a time of chaos. Clear lines were drawn. Either you were for something or you were against something. Either you were for civil rights or you were against civil rights. You were for Vietnam or you were against Vietnam. There was very little, if you remember, very little middle ground in all of that. Now, there were two brave people who fought against chaos during those years. With every fiber of their being and with all the resources at their disposal, Agents 86 and 99 did their best on Monday night on NBC to fight against chaos. You remember Get Smart? Yeah, Get Smart. Yeah, every night it was, it was control whom they worked for against chaos. And they would go to great lengths, and, you know, sometimes it looked bad for them, but they always got out of it, and sometimes they almost got chaos under control. And what did Maxwell Smart say to control? Chief, I missed it by that much. Yeah, Chief, I missed it by that much. Now, I'm not making fun of the 60s. It was a terrible time. There was a, some good things came out of the 60s, but it was a really chaotic time, and we thought we were coming apart at the seams. But chaos is still in our midst, folks. Chaos is still here. How do we explain what happened in Charleston? I mean, those people went to church, to Bible study, to a place where they improved themselves to read scripture, to fellowship, to be a family of faith. And as far as I can tell, and I don't want to prejudge or any of that kind of stuff, but as far as I can tell from what I have read, it's already in print, the young man came in and sat in their midst for over an hour 
And they accepted him. He was of a different race. They accepted him in their midst. And somewhere after an hour, he took his gun and took nine lives. How do we explain that unless chaos is in our midst? Kill some, killing is bad enough, but to kill somebody simply because they're not your race? Chaos. Yeah, I'm with Maxwell Smart, but I look at it a little differently. When Maxwell Smart says, missed it by that much, I look at that and I think, oh my Lord, that may be the only difference between us, you know, from civility and total chaos. That much. Jesus invites those disciples that day to get in that boat and go to the other side. Now, it's in the evening. It's not exactly smart. Uh, I've been on the water a lot. It's, it's not exactly smart to get in a boat at night, especially on the Sea of Galilee. And, and a few of those fishermen in, those, in that disciple group knew that. Now, Galilee, at its widest is about 12 miles, and at its longest, it's about 17 miles. At its deepest, it's about 150 feet. It's a big lake. It's not much of a sea at all. And to the west is the sea, the Mediterranean Sea. Now, that's a sea. And humidity comes off that sea, and it rises up, and it cools down, and the winds come down, crash down on the Sea of Galilee, and it can be calm one minute, and the next minute, minute it's a raging storm. And that's what happens that night. They're peaceful, rocking along, and all of a sudden they're in the midst of a storm, and, and the boat's about to get swamped, and they go and wake Jesus up. Don't you care? He wakes up and he says, peace, and the storm subsides. Now here's what I noticed that I had never really noticed before. Even though they were afraid of that storm, and even though they thought they were going to die, after Jesus stills that storm, those disciples are more fearful of Jesus than they were the storm. Go back and read the text. It says... They were awestruck. They were in great awe. And if you look at the Greek there, it, it, the word there is terrorized. They were in terror of Jesus. They were frightened of Jesus. Why? Because he has just suspended physics. Now Peter and those other fishermen in the boat they know physics. They know what happens to boats. If you, are, if you have any maritime background at all, you, you've heard a pitch pole where if a, if a wave is taller than the boat is long, it will, if it runs into that wave, it will pitch pole. Or it will capsize if the wave is higher than the boat is wide. It'll flip over. That's physics. Who can suspend physics? but the Creator. And they're looking at Jesus in a whole different light now. And it scares them, and it frightens them. Right there in their midst, in that teeny tiny little boat, is the Holy. Five-year-old Johnny had a small hint of that. He was sitting watching his mother cook dinner, and she says, well, you go downstairs and get a jar of apples from the pantry. He says, Mommy, it's dark down there. It's scary down there. And she says, well, go on down there. Jesus will be with you. So little Johnny jumps down. He gets to the door, opens the door. He steps on the first step, and he looks down. He says, Jesus, if you're down there, throw me up some apples. <laughs> Maybe there's more to this boat than just nails and boards and rudder and sail, and pitch. Maybe, maybe this boat, Mark is telling us, is really spiritual. 
The real boat they're in is a spiritual boat. Jesus says, take us to the other side. And the other side is the land of Galilee. And Galilee is full of Gentiles. And no self-respecting Jew would ever have anything to do with a Gentile. So, Jesus is calling these disciples to go straight into chaos and then come out the other side and go into chaos. Wow. And we thought Jesus was only gentle and meek and mild, didn't we? We thought Jesus was only going to comfort us and pat us on the back and affirm us and comfort us, tell us how good we are. But Jesus might just lead our little boat right into chaos, right over to the places we don't want to go or be. Go to the other side. It's easy to stay on this side, isn't it? We can stay on this side and we can use my illustration again. We get fascinated with our own belly button. Ooh, look at there. It's an innie or it's an Audi. You know? We get really fascinated with who we are, what we are, why we are, what we like, what we dislike. It's all about me and nobody else. Yeah, standing on that side of the shore is peaceful and tranquil, you know. But to get in that boat and go to that other side, ooh, my life is going to get disrupted. I'm going to be thinking about things I never thought about before. I'm going to be seeing things I've never seen before. Now, I've been there. I, you know, I was a para, as a paramedic, I developed a a defense mechanism that protected me emotionally. I, I separated myself emotionally from what I saw. You know, and I just, I became a tool to fix people. And I couldn't invest myself emotionally into that brokenness. And I literally could walk by somebody that had a cup and needed money or somebody was hungry, walk right on by them and not think a thing. But that's before the calling. Things change when the calling happens. I tell people sometimes, in a moment of weakness, that faith, faith, hurt. Faith hurt. Because now I can't ignore what I see. I can't ignore the empty cup, or the empty stomach, or the one without a roof. I have to deal with that. Calling, you know, uh, I thought I was going to be a farmer. I really did. I, that was my first hope and dream was to farm. Who could want anything better than that? And then I thought I was going to be a doctor. And then the holy got involved, and I got turned from that into ministry. And Idelically, I thought ministry was going to be idyllic and how chaotic, I did not understand or know at that time. I didn't know uh, the issues that I would have to deal with as a minister way back then. And sometimes at night when, the, when it's dark and I'm thinking about all the things that get dumped into my ministerial bucket, whether if I had to do it all over again, if I would do it. Sometimes, I have to admit that, sometimes. And sometimes at annual conference, and Jonathan this morning, after he was in the first service, Jonathan was sitting here, he said, I wish you had preached this two weeks ago. Sometimes at annual conference, I want to grab the ornads by the arms or shoulders and shake them and say, do you know what you're getting into? Do you know what's going to happen to you? Do you know what's going to be said about you? Do you know what your life is going to be like? but I don't. Somebody say amen. I don't. Thank you. I don't. Why? Because the calling comes and it changes things. It changes. You know, no one in seminary warned me about ministry and what it was really like. And, and none of them get warned. But we're just invited into the chaos by Jesus. I think you've probably know some of this by your own on your own personal level. And I guarantee you 
that most of you grew spiritually when you were at your worst. That you grew more when you were at the lowest point in your life. When you felt like you were so broken that you could not be fixed again. That you were at a point where there was only one movement and that was up. You couldn't get any lower. The 12 steppers call that the moment of clarity. The moment of clarity. But I guarantee you that's the point when the Spirit began to work on your soul and things began to change for you. Humanity can't create enough laws to stop the hate in our world. It can't ban all the ways and all the tools people can use to kill or harm or maim another person. I mean, after all, before, uh, before gunpowder gave us guns, gunpowder gave us bombs, right? You can't legislate hate and anger away. There's no system or politics that can control the human heart. If it's bent on destruction, it's going to destroy. So, the point I'm getting to is this. Let's go. Christ is calling the church. You and me as individuals and us as a family of faith not to stand on the shore on this side and stay fascinated with ourselves nurturing ourselves and doing it for me and, and, and thinking about what's good for me. But to get in the boat and to go to the other side, go into the chaos, go to the place where nobody else would go and redeem these children before they learn to hate, before they ever pick up a gun. Do those things back when they're children that will impede the chaos when they become adults. I think that's the call of the church. Get in the boat. Stop worrying about what is politically correct by the politically correct police and what they might say and head off into the chaos. Embrace it. Challenge it. Christ is there waiting on us. Let us get into Jesus' boat and head into the storm. Amen.